8th of April, 2022, Copenhagen Airport. Passengers were about to unbuckle, reaching for their bags as the plane had landed. But then they looked out the window and saw grass. The flight was veering off the runway. It wasn't slowing down, it was speeding up, heading straight for a fence. Everyone got confused and panicked, and, and then out of nowhere, the plane took off again and the pilot declared, Mayday! But why did the pilot abort after touchdown and send out a mayday as the plane climbed back into the sky? Why did a simple landing turn into a life-threatening situation? This is the story of TAP Air Portugal Flight 754, a flight that did something almost unheard of in aviation. And now, we'll uncover why. Earlier that day, Air Portugal flight was getting ready to fly from Lisbon to Copenhagen. The weather in Lisbon was calm and mild, but in Copenhagen it was cold, windy, and raining with light snow. The winds were blowing from the west at 20 knots with sudden stronger gusts up to 32 knots. This was not unusual for a Scandinavian spring day, but for an aircraft landing, it can be difficult. Plus, all the runways in Copenhagen Airport were facing crosswinds, which means the wind was not blowing straight down the runway, but from the side. Amidst all these, runway 30 is the shortest and has the best alignment with the wind, so the crew expected to use that one. There were 109 souls on board, including the 40-year-old captain, who had flown for nearly 10,000 hours. Half of those hours were on the Airbus A320, and the first officer was 34 and had over 3,000 hours of flight time, with most of it also on the A320. At exactly 12.20 in the afternoon, the plane took off from Lisbon and headed northeast as planned. During the flight, the pilots were already discussing the possible landing difficulties in Copenhagen. In cases, pilots use more flaps when landing on a short runway. Flaps help the plane fly slower without falling, and they create more drag, which helps the plane slow down faster. But in windy conditions, full flaps can make the plane harder to control, like carrying a wide umbrella in a strong wind. So the crew decided to use less flap, which is called flap three. Plus, they also chose a medium auto brake setting. Auto brakes help apply pressure to the wheels after landing so the plane can stop quickly and evenly. But this is where it gets tricky. The exact flap and brake setting they chose was not available in the aircraft. But they checked the numbers again and chose a similar setup that would allow the plane to stop in about 1,540 meters. A pretty good plan. There was a second thought, too, that uses flap three with only low braking system. But it would take 1,930 meters to stop. That was too close to the available 2,000 meters, so increasing the brake setting made sense. But when a plane is in the air and flying straight, a side wind just makes it drift off course. To fix that, the pilot turns the nose into the wind a little. This is called crabbing. But planes cannot land while crabbing. The wheels are made to roll straight, not sideways, and otherwise it puts a huge sideways force on the landing gear. That could break something. So just before touching the runway, the pilot has to turn the nose straight, line up with the runway, level the wings, and gently lower the plane onto the ground. And this is called decrabbing. But it's extremely difficult when the wind is gusty and the plane is shaking. Most big planes can handle up to 30 or 35 knots of side wind when the runway is dry. But when it is wet, that limit drops. Some newer or less experienced pilots are only allowed to land in side winds up to 15 knots. Even experienced pilots need to be extra careful when the wind is close to the maximum allowed, especially when the runway is short, the ground is wet, and the weather keeps changing. And in this case, all of those things were happening at the same time in Copenhagen Airport that day. So when the TAP Air Portugal plane started its landing procedure into Copenhagen, the nose was pointed into the wind to stay on course. But that would have to change at the last moment. The captain would need to straighten the plane, hold it level and touch down exactly right. But just as the runway came into view and the wheels got closer to the ground, a sudden gust of wind came. The nose started to turn, but the timing wasn't perfect. The wheels touched. The plane was not fully straight. At the result, it began to slide. The brakes came on, but not fast enough. Inside the cockpit, everyone felt the inevitable questions with fear. Would the aircraft stop in time? Would the engines respond? Would the runway be enough? The answer came just moments later. The airplane was facing a crosswind of about 20 knots. The weather was still considered good enough to land. So the pilots began their approach. The captain had planned for a normal ILS approach. This is a kind of guided landing using instruments that help the plane stay on the right path during descent. 
After planning everything, the crew asked air traffic control for permission to land. The airplane's engines were CFM-56, similar to those found on Boeing 737 NG jets. But there was one major difference. On the Boeing, thrust reversers are controlled by sliding metal sleeves that push some of the engine's air forward, helping the plane slow down. On the Airbus, things work differently. It uses four doors called blocker doors that move into place to redirect the airflow. Each of these doors is moved by small hydraulic arms and locked in place by a latch and a metal tine, like a double lock system. This whole process is controlled by something called the Engine Control Unit, or ECU. Think of it like the brain of the engine, making sure all the conditions are right before anything happens. The ECU gets signals from many places, like the angle of the thrust levers, the position of the blocker doors, and whether the plane is on the ground. It knows the plane is on the ground thanks to sensors in the landing gear called weight-on-wheel switches. These switches turn on when the aircraft's wheels touch down. TAP Flight 754 was now making its final approach into Copenhagen Airport. It was about 10 in the morning. The air traffic controller guided them toward runway 30 and gave them all the instructions. The crew had done everything except the final landing checklist. They had already connected to the ILS path and started descending. At 10 hours, 1 minute and 55 seconds, the captain lowered the landing gear and moved the flaps to position 3. As the plane passed through 1,420 feet, the captain turned off the autopilot and took control by hand. Although autopilot can stay on even when landing, many pilots turn it off early, especially in rough weather, to feel more connected to the plane. At 10 hours, 5 minutes and 5 seconds, the tower gave the final clearance to land. The airplane was fully ready, gear down, flaps out, everything done. But the wind was still gusty and the runway was wet. The captain focused hard on making a perfect touchdown and slowing the plane as quickly as possible. The approach looked good. The speed stayed close to the target. As the plane crossed over the runway, the ground proximity warning system spoke up in the cockpit. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, retard. At 30 feet, the captain gently pulled the nose up. This is called flaring. It helps the wheels touch down smoothly. The moment the wheels spun telling the computer they were on the ground, and in that very second, the captain pulled the thrust levers into reverse. It was a routine action, but this time something felt different. The engines roared to life, but there would be no second chances now. Once reverse thrust is activated, a pilot cannot take off again. If anything went wrong in the next few moments, there would be no way out. The spoilers popped up from the wings, forcing the airplane's full weight onto the brakes. Everything seemed to go as planned, but in the next few seconds, something would go wrong. Something that could not be undone. And the captain was already past the point of return. The plane had just touched down when everything went wrong. A strong gust of wind slammed into it from the side. The aircraft drifted, tilted, and suddenly the left landing gear lifted off the ground, while the right one stayed down. It was like the airplane had been thrown off balance in the middle of landing. The captain did not like what he saw. He immediately pushed the engines to full power. Because this was no longer a landing, this was a go-around, a second attempt to take off. Without knowing it, the captain had triggered a dangerous chain of events, one that had been quietly waiting in the aircraft's systems for just the right moment to strike. Because the right main landing gear was still pressed down under the weight of the aircraft, the computer locked the thrust reverser doors on the right engine. It was trying to protect the engine from damage, but on the left side, something completely different was happening. That gear had bounced up during the wind gust, so the computer thought the plane was airborne. That meant it allowed the left reverse doors to stay open, even though the pilot was now commanding forward thrust. So now the left engine was blowing air backward. The right engine was pushing forward. Simply put, one side was fighting against the other. The result? A violent force called asymmetric thrust when the engines pulled the plane in opposite directions. The plane jerked to the side and it rolled and yawned sharply to the left. The captain tried to react but he did not apply enough right rudder in time. The aircraft veered left, racing toward the edge of the runway. The wingtip came dangerously close to hitting the ground. Meanwhile inside the cockpit the first officer had not yet called out important warnings like reversers unlocked or spoilers. That meant the captain might not have known the reversers had deployed before he tried to go around. The slip skid indicator, also called the beta target, was supposed to show how much rudder was needed to stay balanced, but it had disappeared. A small flag replaced it. That happens whenever reversers are used. A software setting turns it off, and it could not have happened at a worse time. The airplane bounced again. The captain pulled the nose up and the aircraft just barely took off. 
It scraped over the left edge of the runway, passing only a few meters above the glide slope antenna. Then it crossed the safety area behind the runway, still flying low and crooked. They were climbing, but slowly, at only about 1,000 feet per minute. That is not much when you are flying over homes and trees. The captain retracted the landing gear. The first officer finally called out to the air traffic controller, go around, and then he saw it. A bright warning on the screen in front of him. Engine one reverser unlocked. And that message revealed the reason why everything had gone so wrong. The left engine's reverser doors had not closed properly. So the left engine had stayed at idle all this time. On the other hand, the right engine had been pulling all the weight. The captain now understood the danger. He pushed the rudder hard to the right and lifted the nose of the aircraft to an angle of 12 and a half degrees. The plane was climbing at the usual angle for one engine. It kept going up slowly but steadily. People on the ground had no idea how close they were to a disaster. At just 300 feet, the captain calmly called Mayday and asked to climb to 3,000 feet. The tower approved. The first officer followed the emergency checklist. At 1,200 feet, he shut down the left engine. Soon after the failed warning indicator, the beta target came back. They turned on the autopilot and the climb continued. What happened next will come later, but now the point is the incident revealed a serious flaw in the plane's engine control system. Globally, go-arounds after reverse thrust happen once every million flights. Rare, but not impossible. The risk? Once reverse thrust is used, you're committed to land. Trying to go around after that can be deadly. The reason is this. When the plane first touched the ground, the pilots activated the reverse thrust system, which is normally used to slow the plane down after landing. Reverse thrust works by opening up panels on the engines to redirect the jet's force forward instead of backward, kind of like putting an airplane in reverse gear. But when the plane bounced back into the air, it confused the system. The airplane's computer thought it was still on the ground, but because one of the wheels had left the runway, the signals it sent were inconsistent. The result? The system closed the right engine's reverser like it was supposed to during takeoff, but the left engine's reverser stayed open, meaning one engine was pushing the plane forward normally, while the other was still trying to stop the plane. This caused an uneven force called asymmetric thrust, which made the plane go dangerously and lose power on one side. So here engine breakdown wasn't the only issue. How the software was designed was also the one. The system only checked once whether the plane was on the ground and only from one wheel, instead of constantly monitoring both sides. The pilots didn't know this and believed the reversers would automatically stow away if they chose to go around. That misunderstanding made the situation worse, though it wasn't entirely their fault. That day at Copenhagen, safety teams were warned. If reverse thrust is used and a go-around follows within seconds, something bigger might be wrong. At 3,000 feet, the crew finished their checklists and told passengers everything. And they chose a longer runway, 22 left, for the second landing, which is critical with one engine. But eventually, this time, the plane landed safely. All souls on board walked away unharmed. Investigators reviewed all data and found a key fix. Planes must be able to cancel reverse thrust safely if a landing goes wrong. Luckily, this flight didn't end in tragedy, but it exposed a terrible weak point. Now we want to hear from you. Should aircraft systems be smarter than pilots or is human judgment still our safest bet? Drop your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more real-life aviation mysteries that almost ended in disaster. Until we meet again, stay safe.